Um, I'm not sure if it's down here or if it's on that side. <laughs> little button somewhere around down our here. logo somewhere somewhere <laughs> click on that to subscribe and uh, share these videos Facebook Twitter whatever you can um, we really enjoy doing them and we like inviting you guys into our home inviting you into our lives to discuss these things and we just we appreciate all your support from everyone that's out there and all our subscribers and hope we can continue to provide you guys with the content that you want so say hi um. <laughs> Oh, we should probably read the question, huh? Oh yeah, and the question is from Marsha Parrish, and she said, my question for you is, when you are off duty, do you still find yourself on duty, watching people and keeping yourself aware of your surroundings? Thanks so much. I've got a completely different look than I did when I was a patrol officer back when I first began. Um, when I first began my career, everybody, in the, as far as the public goes, um, I was pretty standoffish. I was, um, I've kind of got this reputation that I may be a little bit of a. What? Oh, I'll leave that out. Where is my um, tablet? A lot of things changed for me when I became a lieutenant. Um, a lot of things have changed throughout my career, and that has caused me to have a little bit of different, a little bit different outlook on certain things in regards to law enforcement. Um, as a lieutenant now, I have more of a public view. Um, I'm the public information officer for our department, so it's a, more about educating the public and being out there in the public's eye and kind of being the face of the department. Whereas when I was a police officer, I wanted to stay in the background, just go out and do my job, go home every night. Um, I didn't really care if I made any friends or not. It was business, you know, um, that was my job. What a nice guy. Go out and enforce the law. Um, and it got worse when you not worse. I mean, it was worse for the better for your safety when you were uh, yeah undercover. And I mean, like I said, everything kind of changed throughout my career. So you have the aspect of being a new officer where you want to go out and be a hard charger and get as many traffic stops as you can, make the most arrests, and so on and so forth. Way to go, rookie! We'll make a cop out of you yet. Then I got promoted to detective, and then it became solving crimes for the officers, helping them out as much as I could. And then I was put into the drug task force and I took on a whole other view of law enforcement altogether. Oh, marijuana. Um, Our whole family did. Yeah, I mean, I shaved my head um, into Mohawk various times throughout my time in the task force. I pierced my ears like the second weekend I was in the task force, um, grew a full length beard and just to the point where members of our church were concerned in regards to was I going through something at work or at home or something because I came to church like a completely different person. But that was the goal, um, to be able to do undercover work and task force stuff in our small town community. I had to change my appearance as much as I possibly could. Um, and short of getting a tattoo on my face, that was the easiest way to do it. Is that a teardrop tattoo? Yeah. Um, but along those lines of changing my appearance came a change in attitude as well. Talk to any undercover narcotics detective or a gang unit detective, anyone in a specialized unit, there are certain ways that you have to hold yourself, carry yourself, and talk while you're in those positions. Ways that are very uncomfortable for other people to be around you when you are that way. And it just takes on it, its own life in and of itself. Very bad man. And so I became a different person while I was in that position. Um, and what sucked for me was coming out of that position um, into a sergeant role. Um, I was only a sergeant for a few months before I was put in as interim chief of police. And so not only did it was I coming out of the drug task force and cussing every other sentence I could think of and every other word I could think of and not at that's home. not at home but just so it was the lingo of the people we were dealing with right. too you got to talk to them how they understand so and that was very 
very much an eye opener to me um, because they do. I mean, I would go in there and talk to them as a new member of the drug task force and try to investigate, try to get them to talk to me, so on and so forth. And I was very polite and very nice in regards to what I was doing. My sergeant would bust into the room and start cussing this, that, and the other, and up, up one side and down the other, and kicked me out of several interviews. Um, and it became a back and forth between him and I until eventually I caught on, and then I would interrupt him and kick him out of the interviews and take over um, midway through. So he would be the nice guy. And it, that good cop, bad cop thing absolutely does play a role in this job. Okay, then there it is. That's it. I, I thought you said bad cop, bad cop. But anyway, getting back to coming out of the drug task force and then being put in as the interim chief, um, I went from completely hiding myself away from the community and trying to keep to myself and keep to the family life away from everybody else um, to now I'm in the public's eye constantly. I'm going to town council meetings, I'm going to city council meetings, I'm going to all these different events and everything in my full blown out uniform with all of my brass on that I can that you can think of and just putting myself out there um, and so I had to start taking a step back from how I reacted while I was a new officer and a drug task force officer to now I'm a public figure um, and it hasn't changed since then. As far as on duty off duty stuff when I was in the drug task force Becca can attest to this um, it was a different life for us as far as being out in the public I didn't interact with anybody. I was always suspicious of everybody. I knew every single doper that was in town, every tweaker that came across us in Walmart. And there were times where Beck and I and the kids would be walking down the aisle and I would just leave them there by themselves um, because of somebody I saw in the store. And I would start following that person around the store, seeing what they were up to and just leave them to do whatever they were gonna do. Or we would have to leave all together because yep. of somebody that he saw in the store. We'd walk in and he'd I would know because he would put his hand right in the small of my back and start leading me wherever, you know, whether it was down a different aisle because we were avoiding someone or back out the store again. And I would never ask why. I just trusted that whatever was happening was he knew and that's what we did. But he went off, off the radar, I guess is what you could call it. No social media, no Facebook, nothing like that. And me as a mom and with little kids because our kids were younger at the time I feel like all of us kind of had to go off the radar I didn't get off completely but I stopped posting super personal personal things on Facebook just to protect our family so, hey. <laughs> yeah. um, one of the other questions that we got was from uh, Del Rio Drifter and he said out of curios curiosity how did you advance to and then leave from so many positions in the department and why? Um, one of the things with our very small police agency is when opportunities for advancement come up, you have to jump all over them. You gotta be prepared to test for those. You gotta be prepared to um, go after those positions if you wanna progress in your career. So, patrol officer for two and a half years, I was a detective for only a year and a half now. The other question to that, the other part of that question was, um, or comment to that question was, um, those positions are very well paying positions. I never got a, a pay raise um, in any of those positions that I took until I made sergeant. Um, not a significant enough pay raise to make it to where I did it simply for the pay. One of the big things people always ask me is how come I left the drug task force so quickly? Um, I can tell you the reason that I left the drug task force was I had just gotten burned out from doing it. I can't take it anymore. It was fun while I did it. It didn't quite last three years, um, but we were. I was on maternity leave with Becca right before I left. When I came back, I just decided that was it. I had. I had my fill with that and I was done and ready to move on. They had a sergeant's testing while I was on maternity leave with Becca and decided I'm going to test for sergeant. If I get it, that'll be my sign that I need to come out of the drug task force. So I ended up getting one of the two sergeant's positions at the PD at the time and that pulled me out of the drug task force. So came a time um, where I got sick of dealing with the same 10% of the community, committing the same crimes against each other and 
having those people then turn around a couple days later and being let out of jail after all the hard work we did and so on and so forth. Um, successes were there as well throughout the time, but the, the defeats sometimes is what it felt like and the, just the overall stress to the family and myself in regards to that position was more than enough for me. The other side of it was while I was in the drug task force, I was on the SWAT team and that didn't last very long. I, I was only on the SWAT team for about four years, um, mostly during my time while I was an MCAT and then for about two years after I came out of the drug task force. Um, and MCAT is the major crimes apprehension team. Um, but my time on the SWAT team, once I was promoted to lieutenant um, and even as an interim chief of police, I just, we, te we trained once a month and I just could not make it to the trainings. And we only had one position to fill at the police department because we're so small, we could only afford one. I just thought that it was completely unfair for me to be taking the sole position on the SWAT team and not utilizing it, not using it. I went out on calls, but we weren't that busy, so I wasn't going out on that many calls to begin with. And I just couldn't make the trainings due to my schedule and meetings and everything else that was coming up. Um, on those training days that I just couldn't get away. And so I ended up stepping down from the SWAT team and allowing someone else to test for it. The quick changes in my career, um, like I said, the opportunities have come up and um, in a small agency like mine, if you don't jump on those opportunities when they come up, it could be 10 to 15 years before they come up again. For me, it's never been about pay. It's always been about serving the community and doing what I can for the community to give back. Um, because I guarantee you, if this was about pay, I wouldn't be where I am right now. I'd be in a whole other town, um, possibly other states at this point in time. The police get called when the crap hits the fan, when you've had your worst day, and we are called in to help you through that, um, to get you the information that we can and help solve whatever problems we can. So your problems become our problems, and it's hard to not take those problems personally, and it's hard to not bring those problems home. Um, so at the same time, you have to have kind of a standoffish, you got to separate yourself to a certain point so that it doesn't eat you alive. Um, because if you let it get into your, your personality, you let it eat away, eat away at you, um, you can kiss family goodbye, you can kiss your career goodbye. Well, for instance, law enforcement has one of the highest divorce rates among all um, careers within the United States. So. He told me that his first week of the academy. They tell us that the first week of the academy. I know, but imagine being, I mean, we were pretty much newlyweds. You were, we were married. We've been half, married not years. even three years yet when he decided to do this career. And he learned that and came home and shared it with me and terrified me. <laughs> but almost 14 years later and yeah. like I said, still here. Like I said, there's a lot of stuff that you can't control. But the stuff that you can control is absolutely imperative that you do. The best way that I've been able to get through it is I have little stuff that I do <clears throat> on my own, whether that's woodworking that we've kind of shown you a little bit of around the house, going out and fishing, um, little things like that. At one point in time, I bought a motorcycle that only lasted like nine months, and that was a stupid purchase. That was completely pointless. Um, but it was just one of those things where it was my way of getting away from my job, my way of getting away from everything in regards to just being by myself and just getting away. So, um, I think fishing does that for you now. Yeah. Cause when I can tell you've had a bad day or a bad week, sometimes I'll ask him, Hey, are you going fishing this week? Just cause I know he needs that alone time to like recharge and not have to be at home dealing with things and not, and he's away from work. So. I feel like that's a good outlet for you. So peaceful and relaxing. Doesn't even matter if I catch a single fish. The restaurant thing. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Just because that's one of the things that he still does even though, even though he's in the role he's in. Whenever we go to a restaurant, and it's not as bad as it used to be, but we would make sure that we were like in a room where we were seated, he would make sure he was seated where he could see the whole restaurant and the front door and as we're walking in he's scoping out everyone in the restaurant just to know who's there what they're wearing what they look like 
all those details. <laughs> well, and I do that for a couple of different reasons. One is the safety of my wife and I and our family if we're in there. But two, I want to know who's in the restaurant just because I want to recognize them before they recognize me. Um, you never know why they're going to recognize you in this profession. I have my face on Facebook for our police department quite a bit. I do videos for our police department. I don't know if they recognize me because of that or if they know I arrested them or their family member or their husband or their spouse, whatever the case may be, and now they're upset with me. So you just never know what your interaction is going to be. You know, when you're in uniform, you pretty much know and you're pretty much on guard all the time as far as when people come up to you to ask you questions or whatever, you kind of gauge how they come up to you and gauge all these different things. Well, when you're in plain clothes and they just recognize you, they don't know where they recognize you from, or maybe they do. There's just no way to tell. Um, so it's just one of those things where you always kind of got to be on guard and that living in the what if kind of mindset of life where what if this happens, what will I do? What if that happens, what will I do? If that happens next, what am I gonna do after that? Um, that can kind of be a stressful way to live your life as well. And so, but that's where police officers thrive is the what if game. And it's not necessarily that it's always a bad what if, but you're always prepared for that to happen. And if that is the worst case scenario that happens, you're already ready for it. Um, and then when it doesn't happen, it's very easy to bring yourself back down to a normal level of stress for the most part um, because it's not going to happen. So We could go on and on about this subject because yeah. you and I took that class <clears throat> together that I think was super helpful as a police officer's wife. Uh, he was a chief, right? Mm -hmm. Come in and teach about how to help your spouse as a police officer deal with what he deals with every day and why he is the way he is, he or she. Um, that was really helpful to me just to bring to light because we've talked about it a lot. We talked about it through the academy, we talked about it through his changes in career, but to have someone come in and actually teach that and like line it out for us and say, this is, this is how he's acting, this is why he's acting this way, and these are some of the things that you can do to keep him in check, even if it's like, hey, you need to go fishing, or hey, you need to knock off the attitude, or just bringing their attention to it as well, because sometimes they don't even realize they're being that way. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to keep him in check in. Bobby, knock it off. Okay. Thank you. It's just communication, I think, and under trying to understand, even though I don't know how he feels, why he's feeling the way he is, and why he's doing the things he's doing. And a lot of the time, it's for our protection. So. Please leave your comments, questions, anything you want down in the comments below and we'll get to those as best as we can and answer you. If not in a video, we'll definitely answer you in a comment. So again, thanks for watching and we'll catch you guys later.